Hello everyone, I'm Ted Oakley, Managing Partner at Oxbow. And as always, I'm here to have a fabulous speaker today that I really like, not only as in the business side, but as a friend, and uh, David Rosenberg. David, glad to have you today. Ted, it's an uh, honor and a privilege, yeah. uh, as usual. Thanks yeah. for the invite. You know, one of the differences, David, between you and, and most people is uh, you not only do economics and strategy, but you do investing. You you package it all, and a lot of people don't have that skill. That's a great skill of yours. Well, I appreciate that. You know, I, I guess when I started early in the business, uh, I, I realized that if, as an economist, if you stop at GDP, uh, it's interesting and informative, but it doesn't really help people make uh, decisions. So, uh, and all those years I had uh, at Merrill, you know, on the uh, sitting there on the trading desk. Uh, you know, you, you you learn quickly how to take the economics and make it relevant for investors. Well, I'm going to start out with what uh, obviously is top of the mind for most people. And you've been around a lot. And, you, and I know you can feel this when people get real sensitive and real keen on something. And you've noticed the public, you know, the last 10 days or so, really worrying about their funds. Uh, not so much the market, but hey, is my money okay? Um, mm. But how are you? How are you seeing the fallout from from this bank situation? Well, uh, I, I I could tell you what I what I don't see it as, uh, and I don't see it as uh, a repeat of 08 or 09. I mean, I get a lot of those questions. Are we going through another one of these uh, type of uh, financial contagions? And um, although this is not going to be a walk through the park, uh, and uh, the volatility in the markets uh, and um, the problems at a lot of the smaller mid-sized banks, they're not going to go away. Uh, but I remember back in 08 and 09, it, it was really about these opaque, very leveraged uh, mortgage securities uh, that uh, uh, had all this counterparty risk. I mean, if you were a bank, you didn't know who else owned own these securities and it turned into this gigantic source of uh, uncertainty and nobody wanted to do business with each other. Uh, you know, this is, uh, this is different, but you know, every Fed tightening cycle uh, ends with some sort of financial accident. Uh, we're living history in real time. Uh, and I think what we finish off here with is going to be more banking sector uh, re-regulation, higher funding costs for the banks, uh, probably a compression in the uh, regional banking industry. I'm looking a lot at this, uh, Ted, much like the savings and loan crisis uh, of the late 80s, early 90s, which was about a four year workout period. We had a recession and a credit crunch. It wasn't systemic risk. It didn't affect the major money center banks, nor will this, um, but it led to a few years of, uh, uh, of credit contraction and uh, financial institutions uh, more focused on shoring up their balance sheets than on extending credit. And that's the dilemma here is that uh, even if this isn't like 08 or 09, uh, a credit-driven economy needs credit to grow. Uh, and so I think we're going to have a recession out of this, and then we're going to have a very weak recovery. Uh, so I think that's really what I can come out of this. This is a, a deflationary event. Uh, it brings the recession more into view. But I'm not um, screaming from the mountaintops that, uh, you know, that the world's about to end or that the problems of Credit Suisse or SVB uh, are going to be so broadly based in nature that it's going to bring down the system. Uh, but uh, the volatility and the market weakness and, and the anxiety, uh, unfortunately, uh, that process isn't over yet. And, you know, David, uh, both of us were around during the uh, savings and loan debacle. But I'm not certain, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but have you ever thought about, and I know this went on, by the way, uh, the credit unions loaned a lot more money long term than they should have during this last period. Yeah. Uh, and you don't hear much about it, uh, but I know they have. They've got too much money loaned in the long end, uh, when obviously the only thing they've got to deal with is short, you know, short money that they pay deposits on. Um, so you could you, you could have all sorts of things come out of this in the end, really, when it's all said and done. Well, I, I think that uh, another well card in all this that uh, wasn't around as much back then was private equity. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is where a lot of these companies uh, had these special relationships. And 
their assets or not and just in long-term treasuries which you could argue have now been ring fenced uh, by this new um, uh, facility by the fed to uh, yeah have them you know sold at par if they have to move them off their balance sheets uh, and that's the one thing that I find very interesting is that here we are sitting here today, you know, let's call it almost uh, a week after the SVB uh, crisis unfolded and led to the demise of the bank uh, that nobody yet is lined up uh, to buy uh, the leftover assets. Um, treasuries are fine. Uh, you could argue high quality mortgage backed securities fine. Um, but these other assets uh, that have polluted their balance sheet, well, nobody's lined up to buy them. I guess nobody really knows how to price them. But, you know, Ted, yeah. you know, the one thing I'll say is that heading into this, we were heading into a recession anyway. It was obvious to me. Uh, it wasn't happening today, but I think by second or third quarter, I think Brian Moynihan at Bank America, who's usually a very jolly fellow, uh, was saying third or fourth quarter. That was a few weeks ago. My models are saying more like second or third quarter. Nobody ever said that the recession was going to start in the fourth quarter last year or the first quarter this year. You know, you know there are lags. Uh, but two things were happening even before the onset of this new chapter of uh, the credit cycle, which is loan delinquencies across the board were starting to rise, albeit from low levels. But they always start the reversal uh, from low levels. It's like the unemployment rate. People say, well, uh, it's low. Uh, but it rises off the low in every cycle. So do delinquency rates. And so the Fed Loan Officer Survey, uh, which came out, showed that the banks, whether it was commercial real estate, commercial industrial loans, credit cards, uh, auto loans, even residential mortgages, uh, that the banks are starting to tighten the screws right across the board. So there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, Ted. I, I don't think anybody professes to know how this event exactly is going to play out. We all know that um, that the, the governments and the central banks, uh, you know, acted very early. Whether they acted enough, uh, well, you know, time will tell. But what I think what we have to we have to talk about is what we know with certainty, which is that this is going to create a, a contraction in credit. You're, you're seeing it already. Even before this, you were seeing deposit outflows in the banking system, uh, and not just in the regional banks too. In the overall banks, deposit outflows. Uh, and at the same time, if you're taking a look at asset growth in the banking system, it's been slowing down dramatically in the past year. And that's going to be reinforced by the conditions we have right now. And to me, you know, that to me is the is the the elephant in the room nobody talks about is that all this has happened in the context of the economy has been weak in the past year, but has not been recessionary. What happens to credit quality and what happens to the banks once the recession starts? And then you start getting um, a more pronounced uh, erosion in credit quality and loan defaults, which always happen in a recession. And this is what's going to be dominating in the next year. That's going to be the knock-on effects from all this. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the, the graphs you have, which is excellent, by the way, is about talking about four years of price hikes lumped into one year. And it was almost to us, it was an admission by the Fed that, hey, we really messed up back there, so now we have to go overboard. You've got a great hike on that, showing an unprecedented move in those. Well, you know, what was interesting was that, uh, you know, we went into this bear market, the bear market starting, say, at the end of uh, 2021. Profit margins were at an all-time high. Uh, and so maybe it's the only thing I will ever agree with Joe Biden on, which is that there was a ton of price gouging going on uh, in the corporate sector, everybody used the inflation anxiety uh, as rationale and as opportunity to raise prices and fatten your margins, even if you didn't have to. Uh, and so I think that that was one of the other elements that the inflation we had was over and beyond just what could be explained by COVID and the reopening and the global supply chains. Uh, and so What's happened, of course, is that uh, we had, um, as you said, four years of price hikes rolled into one year. We had a, you know, massive supply shocks recurring, including the war in the Ukraine, which is another global supply shock on the cost side and bumping against the really the ridiculous and radical uh, stimulus checks for all that uh, lingered on those excess savings that went right into the modern day. Uh, so you did have demand and supply bumping into each other on the inflation side. And uh, the Fed was uh, 
yeah, the Fed was uh, slow off the mark. It's not it's not the first time that we've seen the Fed being slow and the overease. And then on the other side of the mountain, uh, they massively over tighten. And that's why we're getting these boom bust cycles. Uh, and that's why the business cycle has been so accentuated is because and I don't know what's going on in the central banks, why they're so late. Uh, look how late they were. I mean, here you had Bernanke setting us up for a huge bubble by you know, the recession's already over by oh, well over a year in 2010. He's doing QE2. What was that all about? And then QE3. Because uh, I think that they, uh, they love, all live in academia. You know, then, then we get Jay Powell as chairman and people say, well, thankfully, for the first time, we're not getting some academic economist in there. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm not so sure. Uh, well, I'm not so sure getting a lawyer is any better. Any better. You know, say, well, I was going to tell you. What's a lawyer and economist at the bottom of the ocean? <laughs> and the answer is uh, it's a good start. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if Powell's not an economist in the classical sense. The Fed, um, they were too slow to move uh, when inflation was proving non-transitory. Uh, and now we're paying a price on the other side. Well, you have a great graph, though, on the fact that they, the inflation story was, you know, supply side induced, but then you're then the Fed's trying to fix it with a demand side. Pro, you know, the answer. I, I those two are going to have a hard time going together. Well, it's uh, you know what what Powell Powell gave us a lot of information uh, in the press conference of the first rate hike, which was uh, exactly a year ago, where he said, <coughs> you know, we're not going to. Um, we're not going to pay attention to the to the supply side anymore, and uh, I thought at the time, well, then how do you how do, as a central banker forecast inflation with just a demand curve? I mean, because you learn in economics 101, you need two curves to forecast prices. You need supply and demand. But you see, it was a case of once burned, twice shy, and uh, and I think that uh, you know the 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 Chinese lockdowns and. Uh, uh, you know, these recurring variants, and uh, then you had the war in the Ukraine, all these su supply side situations. Uh, remember, it wasn't just demand in the 1970s. Uh, we had, you know, seven of those 10 years, we had a, su a supply shock from the uh, from uh, from OPEC. So we're living through these supply shocks. We got inflation running rampant. Uh, of course, there was a demand element to this as well. But the Fed says we're not going to focus on the supply side. I said, well, that's interesting. And what's, what's actually, I think, very f fascinating is that the supply part of the inflation equation is already in the process of being solved. Uh, we're seeing supply delivery delays are actually below where they were pre-COVID. So the supply bottlenecks have fallen by the wayside. And you're seeing that in the commodity markets. I mean, the CRB is down 16%. You're seeing it. I mean, oil's down almost 50%. Um, and virtually all the commodities are in some sort of correction or bear market right now. So you're seeing it real time on the good side. Uh, the demand side is interesting because uh, the Fed's concocted this new CPI. That's, you know, the core services X shelter. So what they're focused on is 20 percent of the index that are basically uh, services like airlines and restaurants, hotels, motels, and they still have pricing power. Uh, and that's why the Fed's looking at this index that so we saw last month. It was up 0.5%. Uh, and, um, and that's where they think the big, you know, the big mismatch is in the labor market. That, and that's what they're focused on. You know, in the interim, in the interim, I think what's very important, and, and you mentioned it on the, on the supply side, is we're seeing um, commodity prices coming under tremendous downward pressure. Uh, and uh, we're also seeing, benevolently, import prices are now deflating uh, for the first time uh, since uh, 2020. Uh, and to me, that's a very good sign, because if the Fed wants to focus on its particular price indices, let go ahead and do that. They're focused on 20 percent of it. Doesn't mean the rest of us have to follow suit. Uh, the underlying inflation situation is much better uh, than the Fed is indicating and is actually much better than what you hear about in the media. You know, you have, uh, speaking of that, you have a, a really interesting chart you might talk about. It's, it's an ode to Warren Buffett on what happened back in, you know, after the, uh, the, the, flu, the flu came right. up back then and everything that went on after that and how long it took to get back to normal. Do you think we are looking a lot like that? Well, it, you know, there's, it's a sample size of one. Uh, and, of course, you're talking about the famous quote about uh, the one thing that uh, – 
people don't learn from history is that the they would learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Um, but we had a situation uh, back a century ago where we had a uh, a war and a and a health shock. Of course, this time around, the health shock came first, and the war back then was World War One, and then the uh, Spanish flu. And uh, we had four years of 15% inflation. Uh, I mean, we, here we had in the United States, God forbid, one month, one month of 9%. That 9% is still embedded everywhere. Uh, and uh, comparisons to the 1970s, we had one month of 9%. We had four years of 15% inflation. And it was a massive supply shock. And the chart goes on to show that, you know, once these supply pressures abated, and I don't know what Putin's plans are in the rest of Europe, but I think the war in Ukraine isn't going so well for him right now. Uh, I don't think that uh, we're going into uh, a prolonged war that's going to engulf all of Europe. And I think that COVID, you know, we're living with it uh, if, if it's not in the back in the rearview mirror. So my point was that uh, unbeknownst to all the people back then who I'm sure that uh, if Larry Summers great grandfather was around in that period is probably talking incessantly about secular inflation. Once those pressures subsided, we went through a decade of either price stability or deflation. So what I'm saying is that I don't believe in new eras. I'm a Bob, Bob Farrell disciple. There are no new eras and excesses are never permanent. And so I think that once we, you know, I mean, inflation is a lagging indicator, but these supply pressures are fading. And you know, what's kept the inflation higher for longer has been these excess savings that people still had to spend. So the demand side still remained uh, relatively inflationary, but that's going to fall by the wayside in the next year as well. So that's the major point is that we're, we're, we're going to normalize. We're going to normalize back to where we were. I think inflation is going to come down and surprise a lot of people in the next 12 months. You know, on that note, I've said all along here, the, the last uh, six to nine months, you know, the, the, the money people keep talking, but the rich people have the money. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, bo the bottom 60%, they, they don't have any money. But you also, in this Fed thing, you know, and, and I think you, you, you and I agree on this, I believe that there's never been such an obsession with trying to catch the very time the Fed's going to stop and pivot and all, mm -hmm. that, all those words they use. But you have a really interesting graph that talks about the fact that you don't buy the market on the first rate cut. There's a, there's a lot to go after that. You've got some really good numbers on that and that, uh, that, that shows. Interesting con concept. Well, you know, you get, you get a hiccup. You get a nice tradable rally. I mean, for anybody who's got ice in their veins uh, and think that they're as good as trading the market as Paul Trader Jones, then... You know, you get a uh, you get a hiccup, but I mean, I mean, we we had eight bear market rallies last year in a market that was down almost twenty percent. So you're quite right. Um, you know, uh, I'll take you back to the Fed, January third of two thousand and one. Uh, I was at Merrill Canada at that point, and uh, Greenspan cut rates fifty basis points intermeeting January third of 2001. Of course, when the Fed realized, Greenspan had thought mistakenly that we were just into some sort of inventory withdrawal um, cycle. Then he realizes, oops, no, we are actually heading into a devastating deflationary detonation of the technology capital stock. So their cut rates, remember back then the funds rate was about six and a half percent. We went all the way down to one percent by the time it was over. Uh, the S&P that day, it popped like three or four percent. And oh, that yeah. was uh, oh, January. Yeah, and January the, the low, one was a big month. The, the, that was a big yeah, month. Yeah, the, the lows, the lows were the lows were like forty percent later. Yeah, and it wasn't just the Nasdaq. The S and P five hundred doesn't bottom until September of two thousand and two. And then you go back. I remember I was at Merrill in New York, and they cut rates uh, in August of '07. My phone is ringing off the hook all day long. Got to buy the market. Got to buy the market. You know, well, the recession started in December of '07, and then the fundamental lows didn't happen sixty percent later till. March of 2009. So 100% right. You 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 the, the the you don't you know you can trade the first for you know, one two or three rate cuts if you believe it's a soft landing. Then actually that's a buy and hold. Uh, if it's a recessionary bear market, um, you really start to buy the market for good. Like I'm talking about all ten toes 
uh, when you're 70% of the way into the easing cycle and the Fed has pivoted, for lack of a better term, that's a new central bank uh, lexicon uh, pivot, the, the yield curve, once the yield curve has positively steepened uh, two tens to 140 basis points, that's really the all clear signal. And we're a long ways away from that. So, you know, the Fed will pause, market will rally, then it'll roll over as the recession pressures hit earnings. Uh, and then uh, the Fed will be forced to raise rates. It's just the cycle. You know, there's the rate cycle, the market cycle, economic cycle, these centrifugal forces that intersect with each other. Um, and so that's the way I think it's going to play out, that you really want to be buying the market closer to the end of the easing cycle, not the beginning of it. Well, you know, uh, we've always said, and I see people do this all the time, they use the Fed as the roadmap to how they're going to invest. And we've always said, hey, you're, you, you shouldn't believe much of that. You have a, another great chart about how the Fed has missed on all their forecasting. Uh, you can't see a recession when it's right in front of them. And it, it's a really good chart. It shows a lot of history. Well, it's, it, it shows the, um, the, the, the economic forecasts. You know, Ted, uh, all the way back to the late 60s, we have enough data points to see that uh, this is the, and it's not like three months before the recession or six months. It's the month that the recession is about to begin. And every time their forecast for next year's GDP growth for the next 12 months has got a positive sign in front of it. Uh, so the error term is huge, and you're right. They uh, and and it's hard to explain. They have 350 PhD economists with their fancy schmancy econometric models, and I I know look at I I I've gotten market calls wrong too, you know. So I, I live in a glass house, although I don't intend to. But the thing is that I don't control the monetary levers, uh, and um, you know, and I don't tend to miss uh, the big calls. Uh, and the thing is that they missed not just one or two recessions on the eve of the recession, Ted, they missed every single one of them. And that's why historically they're very slow at the beginning. That's why the, the lag between the last rate hike and the first rate cut is six months because they're sort of sitting in purgatory. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to relive the same cycle this time around as well. It's so true, too. And, and I'll, I'll give you some credit here. You've had a lot more right than you ever had wrong. So, uh, you, you, and one reason for that is because you're in the money business. So, you know, you have to have a report card <laughs> and, and that makes a lot of difference for us the same way. Um, let, one other thing you've talked a lot about too, and, and trying to get around to this is the stock and bond markets now, because that's, that's really what people are interested in. And if you look at it from this standpoint, you've got some interesting points on what happens to bonds and where they hit during the recessionary laydown and what hap and when you want to see stocks and where they start to move. A great graph on a before and after recession. Uh, interesting, and you, and you show it well in both of those. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's been a recession even in the stagflationary 1970s when we had three of them uh, where long bond yields or, or the 10-year yield failed to go down. Uh, and so, again, it's a case, Ted, where your assumptions drive your conclusions. Uh, my assumption is that the business cycle has not been repealed. My assumption is that after the most pernicious Fed tightening cycle since 1981, 1981, you, you want to be buying treasuries. Uh, and uh, so, and all the leading indicators are pointing the way towards a recession. This talk of no, lawn, no landing and soft landing are just... Uh, a violation really of mother nature, not just of uh, the business cycle. So, yeah, so I think that uh, long-term rates uh, are gonna come down. They come down in recessions. And actually, if you wanna be bullish on the stock market, you've gotta be bullish on the bond market first. And by the way, the bond market's done some heavy lifting already. I mean, we've, we've come down about 100 basis points on the 10-year note. Uh, the question is, you know, what's the level of the 10-year note that will provide more of a more reasonable uh, opportunity or valuation from a, an equity risk premium standpoint. Uh, bond deals have to come down. Bond deals, and this happens actually every cycle, every cycle before every cycle, just like in the early 80s, okay? During the book, you know, you've got a central banker compares himself to Volcker, that's fine. How did you want to invest around Volcker? Well, at some point, i.e. by August 1982, uh, you know, we got the stock market down to a level that you can go in and and buy and not just buy but buy for the next eight years we had a nice multi-year outside of the 
uh, October 87, um, you know, meltdown. It looks like a speck of dust uh, on an Ibsen chart today. But bond yields have to come down first. Bond yields always come down first in a recession. And equity valuations also come down. And you get to a point where the equity risk premium gets above 400 basis points. And that's the aha moment alongside the steeper yield curve. Positive hope you. you see, people say there's no alarm bells that go off. Well, no alarm bells go off on the day of the lows. Uh, and I never recommend that anybody jumps in. But you start to scale in when you get the ERP over 400 basis points, twos, tens, or 140 basis points, that's what I'm going to be looking for to, to turn very bullish. Uh, I'm hoping it's going to be in the next 12 months. But bonds have to rally first to breathe the relative valuation into the stock market. Well, you know, I think one thing you mentioned there, a word you mentioned, which uh, we do at Oxbow, we do scale in the buys and scale in the sells. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that the individual investor makes is that it's all or nothing. And, and I think that's one of the big problems they have. They really uh, don't, sort of don't understand the business enough to understand what you need to do. But it's interesting you make that comment. Well, you know, I, I guess I look at it that, you know, when, when I see the storm clouds coming in and I guess people say, boy, what, what storm cloud has Dave Rosenberg ever not seen? But, you know, the thing is about bear markets is that they tend to be, you know, elevators going down and bull markets or escalators going up. So at the first hint of trouble, I say, you know, get out of Dodge or make sure your portfolio is hedged appropriately. And so if you miss the first few months of a bull market, if it's actually a bona fide bull market, it's going to be around for years and you can participate. Uh, so I think that you're right, though, in terms of, uh, you know, I will be talking when, when I see the metrics and it's basically, look, when we're in the seventh inning of the recession, and we're in the seventh inning of the Fed easing cycle and all these other valuation metrics. And I'm talking about the equity risk premium has got to be double where it is today. You don't get paid to be in stocks today. Uh, you got to be paid to take on that risk. It's just simple math. Uh, and we have to get through the recession, which is only now starting. I've never seen a bear market end as the recession is just starting. It's usually, uh, I mean, not every cycle is the same. You bought them 30% into the recession in 1991, but most of the time, and then, of course, you, you bought them very late in the cycle. Back in March of 2009, the recession was about to end. But when you're taking a look at mean, median, mode, and you're playing the probabilities, which we should all be doing, uh, the best time to be scaling in, as you said, is going to be when we're 70% of the way through the recession. I think the recession will be a three-quarter recession. I think it's going to start next quarter. Uh, so it probably means that uh, it's going to be a very tough spring and summer, lots of volatility. I don't think the market has hit the fundamental lows. I think those October lows will be broken. Uh, and um, and then by the fourth quarter, it's going to be, I think, a um, better, better period to be uh, uh, making an asset mix move back in equities. Of course, I'm just playing this through my mind right now as I, I lay out a map. Uh, but I think that would be reasonable. Uh, and again, in that in that context, the Fed will be cutting interest rates. People don't believe the Fed will be cutting interest rates. The Fed will be cutting interest rates. They'll have to. And I'll tell you that historically, in a recession, the Fed cuts rates 500 basis points. Maybe this whole way through, it was all camouflage. Oh, the inflation's not transitory, all this other stuff. Maybe all along it was about rebuilding the bullets. Uh, for the next cycle, which, you know, Powell never got a chance to. What did he get to? Back, despite all the bravado, you know, he took over the helm at the Fed back in January of 2018. And, you know, uh, even in spite of all the Trump tweets, he kept on raising rates. And then he gets stopped out at 2.5%. Uh, and this time around, he's getting to 5%. And if you take a look at the historical record in recessions, nobody ever believes that the peak of the rate cycle, people always say the same thing. Oh, they'll never cut rates. They'll never cut rates. And then, of course, there's a, traditionally a six-month lag between the last rate hike and the first rate cut. But interest rates are cyclical. They are cyclical. It's part of the cycle. They'll be cutting rates. The question will be, are we going back down to the zero bound? And I'm just saying that I'm an economic historian at heart. And historically, and I don't think we're going to be talking about 6% inflation this time next year. Uh, we could be going back down to the zero bound, you know, which, by the way, tells you, wow, you know, if you do a normalized yield curve, the 10 year notes going below 2%. I think that we're going to get some nice, juicy returns uh, in the longer end of the Treasury market in the next 12, 
uh, it's already been a great place to be since October, by the way. Nobody talks about, oh, 60-40 doesn't work anymore. That was an anomaly last year. Uh, but I think that the 40 in that 60-40 called Treasuries worked out really well over the course of the past six months. And I think that's going to continue. You know, uh, everything that you just said, you have in a really good chart called um, the six catalyst that happened at the um, stock market yeah. bottoms. And one of those things on there, which you'll notice in the graph, um, and I don't think people realize this, but if you have a recession drawdown in the market, that's a really high percentage from where it was, you know, where you get a drawdown from. And so people, I think, think, uh, well, you know, we have, you know, 20, 25 percent, so that, that should be enough. But, you know, according to what you see historically, that's not the way it would go. Yeah, exactly right, Ted. You know, look, we, we've had recessionary bear markets in the past where the peak to trough decline in the S&P was 20%. 1990, good example of that. You know, but your starting point on the multiple uh, was like, you know, 16 times earnings. You know, we started this one at 22. And, and even as you and I sit here today, we're still basically north of 17. Um, so we've done all this hard work, and a lot of the hard work has been multiple compression. And all we've done is, yeah, we've taken four and a half points off the multiple. The earnings recession has only really started in the past couple of quarters, and that's going to be ongoing through the balance of this year. So, you know, when I do the math, you know, I do the math on this. Uh, what is a classic recession multiple? Uh, recession trough multiple is 15. So you see in that last period that I talked about 1991, you didn't need to have, you had an earnings recession, but you didn't have to have tremendous multiple compression because we didn't start that cycle with an equity bubble like we did this time around. Uh, so the starting point of the multiple, even right now and where we're going to, and then what, what's a classic for a recession hit to earnings is 20% with a tight standard deviation. I mean, this is just basic math because all the S&P 500 is, at any point in time is a product of two numbers, EPS and the multiple, you're gonna slap on those earnings. So we get a 20% hit, you're down 185 on earnings, uh, and you're talking about a 15 multiple, and the math on that is daunting, because it means you're going down to roughly 2,800 on the S&P when all is said and done. And that's what I'm saying is I know it's a horrible, horrible outcome but bear markets and bull markets are attached with each other, just as recessions and expansions. They're just part of the cycle. And that's not a problem for people that are prepared, i.e. people that have liquidity on hand when the weak hands get traded to the strong hands. Having liquidity on hand and, and, and being in long bonds right now. Uh, and, and actually, that will not be a horrible outcome for those people. Now, one, one, just one quick thing, too. I think you, you, you're okay with some gold, though, I think. Uh, yeah, I believe. yeah, uh, absolutely. And gold's been doing great. And that's because you got the ECB uh, as lag behind the Fed. Now the ECB, they just won 50. You know, uh, they have more to go because they started later. And interest rate differentials are going to work against the U.S. dollar. Uh, and then you got maybe the new governor, the Bank of Japan, is going to start to tweak policy more to the tighter side or less accommodative side as the Fed is going towards the more accommodative side. So all, all paths lead to a weaker dollar. All paths are gonna lead to lower real interest rates. And if you ever do a gold model, real rates and the dollar, that's all you need to know. And so I think that I, 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 won't, be, I won't be surprised if gold goes back to, uh, to the highs it was at a couple of years ago. So I think yes, 100% right. The bond bullion barbell is what I call it because I love alliterations and, and, and you know, uh, that 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 bond barbell, uh, bond bullion barbell, Ted, has uh, generated a return of six and a half percent so far this year. Yeah. Well, I wanted to uh, one last question for you, and I I I think you know where I stand on this because we've been we spoke uh, at a couple things together before, but you know uh, you have much experience in all sorts of up and down markets and and, and what you have to do in certain things, and I've mentioned this before. But if you look at the average tenure in the industry right now, it's it's really only been during this really Goldilocks period uh, that you you could just plug and play and forget everything and that sort of thing. And so what I'm finding is there's really a, a big lack of experience to get through hard times because we see a lot of portfolios that come in and we're like, 
hey, did you do anything? Did you make any changes at all? And do you see that? Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, 100%, both in my client base, even among <laughs> the younger staff, I, I think that, um, I, I think I bring up the median age of the people that work at Rosenberg Research to like, uh, you know, 28. So, uh, but, you know, it's, it's a great point, and I'll tell you why. Because all along, what is, um, you know, what's Powell been doing is compare himself to Volcker. Uh, so we come off supply shock. Uh, we come off, uh, uh, you know, this inflationary bulge, which no, no, really nobody has seen until uh, that period of, uh, of 40 years ago. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the next thing you know, we had some banking crises back in the early 1980s, right? We had, uh, you know, whatever, uh, Penn Square and kind of... And, and look, uh, life went on. Uh, you know, we ultimately bought, people say, "What was the people talk about? What's the Fed put?" You know, the the if he compares himself to uh, uh, to, uh, to Volcker, the Volcker put in uh, in August of '82 was eight on the on the multiple. So I'm not saying we're not going to eight. Okay, I don't think I don't, I'm not that bearish. All right, um, but yeah, a lot of people have. Let's face it, uh, most people in this industry have only known QE. They've only known that the the Fed always has your back. The Fed always has your back. You see, that's the thing is that, and it might be something that I think Powell has been trying to break here is this unhealthy extreme link between the financial economy and the real economy. And I think that he's trying to do two things at the same time. He's trying to kill Pavlov's dog and all the salivating about Fed, Mr. Fed, please help me, uh, and uh, and taking the punch bowl away. And I think that's been part of it. So, uh, yeah, a lot of people in the industry – yeah, look, and you saw it. You saw it a couple of years ago. The Fed, because of course, it's, and it started. You could argue with Greenspan got reinforced by Bernanke. The Fed has my back. The Fed has my back. The young people, the Fed has my back. All the Reddit and the Robin Hood people, the Fed has my back. And then in the past year, like I was telling these people, these younger people, the Fed has your back, all right. But he's got a knife in it and he's <laughs> twisting it. <laughs> well, listen. On that note, uh, I want to thank you. Uh, and by the way, for everyone li uh, watching this. During this, you've seen a number of times a streamer uh, that tells you where you can go to uh, get various services that you have, David. And by, I'm going to mention something on those two, and that is that for what you pay and what you get, it's really worth it. And you put out a lot of content for people to digest. I think it's one of the best things on the street, and I'd recommend people to go look at that. But David, I want to thank you very much for being with us. and. Uh, you know we'll be coming back to see you again, you know, within the next year. <laughs> uh, I, I certainly hope so, Ted, and I also hope to see you in person again. It was uh, wonderful to sit beside you at the Vail Conference uh, last January. That was uh, that was the highlight for me. Uh, so, well, if uh, I was as good a speaker as you, I'd, I'd feel great about that. But uh, you were oh, you uh, obviously great. have a lot. You have a lot going when you speak. So, well, David, thanks a lot. We'll see you next time. Very great. Thanks again. You bet. Hello everyone, I just want to say if you like this video and you want to see more of this type of information, because we really try to get the information that you don't see from anybody else, then be sure and click on subscribe and you'll see more of what we do here at Oxbow.